I uh, know a family. I'm not going to name names. A family friend. They're like us. They try to keep the commandments of God and the testimonies of Jesus. But they have, they have a rule that their family abides by. And we all have, our families all have extra rules. One of our rules in our family is, is we make a mess, we clean a mess. Uh, it doesn't quite work that well with, <laughs> with small children, you know, five under five when, they, when the old, youngest was born. But we, we have different rules that we set up, you know, separate to God's, rule, God's laws, God rules. And this family, friends of ours, this family that I know, they have a, a rule that they abide by. They don't make promises. This is, a, this is something that they, they've chose for their family not to do. And when I heard about this fact that they don't make promises, I was kind of a bit taken back. You know, I think as, as followers of Jesus, as, as we are, um, they weren't making promises and then in turn they weren't keeping them. I thought, what do you mean? You know, after all, this book is full of, of promises, God's promises. And a slow, as we count slow, fulfillment of those promises. You know, that's, it, it's replete. But this rule that this family was living by, was they were responding in, to Jesus' teaching in Matthew 5, where we're going to start this morning. Matthew 5. You know, he, was, he was at the Sermon of the Mount, his great sermon, and he was explaining here, when we turn, Matthew 5, the intent of some of God's laws and what it was always about and how God's perfect written law compared to what was taught orally. You know, you heard it was said compared to it is written. So we, we turn to chapter 5 of, of Matthew, starting in verses 3, and just as a starting point for what we're going to talk about today, just to get us in the, the, the frame of mind. Again, you have heard in verse 33, said to those of old, you should not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I have said to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no, and anything more than this comes from evil. And we're not going to turn there, but... Numbers 30, God takes the time in his law to record a whole chapter uh, devoted to these oaths or vows that people can take. You know, so we can see it's really important to God. And in verse 2 there, we won't turn, but it says, He shall not break his word, the person making this oath. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. And when we read on, which we won't now, you can have a look later, we see a separate uh, criteria for women, that even their father, when they're in their father's house, and when they're married, then when in their, you know, in their husband's house, so to speak, that they, their father or their, or their husband, can oppose a rash vow or oath that they make. So clearly we see, you know, God's taking the time that his oath shouldn't be taken lightly, and they're important to God. Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines an oath as a solemn, usually formal calling upon God to witness to the truth of what one says or intends to do. You, know, you might think of the United States enshrined in, in their law and in their constitution is these oaths that they take and often even putting one hand on the Bible as, a, as, invoking a, you know, as a symbol, invoking the highest moral authority of God himself as witness to their oath on, on their testimony of what, they, you know, of, of what has happened or their commitment of what they are committing to do. Yet when we read Matthew chapter 5, it's, it's a different story. Jesus is saying, you know, don't, don't even take an oath at all. You know, by heaven, 
by the throne of the throne of God, by earth, it's his footstool, by Jerusalem, the city of the great king of Jesus. Um, you know, we can't pull, we can't bring God down. We don't have authority to do that, to, to evoke, evoke God. It's not in our authority. When God promised, he promised by himself, because he can. The highest authority, but for us, no, we, we, can't, we can't do so. And even to change the colours of our, on our hairs of our head. You know, we dye it for a time, some of the ladies, but it's not permanent. We don't even have control to do that. A little places, Jesus says, you can't even grow yourself one inch in stature, you know. It wasn't that Jesus was contradicting the law, but he was rather showing the intent further of of what God always had for his people, for his creation. You know, because when we we take an oath, we're implying this sort of double standard that, okay, now, now, my hand on the heart or, you know, hand on the Bible, now you can trust what I say. You know, I promise. (laughs) But rather, God wants everything everything that proceeds out of our mouth to always be true, to be pure, to be of value, of of esteeming others more than ourselves, always not to bring others down, to have worth. As James uh, paraphrases Jesus in his letter, in 5 verse 12, he says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. So I'll just use this example as a, as a segue to talking about the importance of safekeeping our word. Safekeeping our word so we can better reflect the will and the heart of, of Jesus as we, as we minister to others. Now safekeeping, put sort of simply, means protection from harm or loss. I was thinking about the title of the sermon and I thought... It's more than just, you know, keeping God's word. Uh, sorry, excuse me, keeping our word. Or uh, always telling the truth, even though it's part of the, those things. Or never lying, although it's, that's part of it as well. But being made in the image and likeness of God, you know, elevated above all animals, given the ability to speak. You know, a parrot can parrot. They can speak back what you teach to them. But we have this ability above any other with language. We have, so we have this great responsibility to use our mouths wisely. And I'll just take a moment and say, I did not talk to Leah about the children's story <laughs> this morning. And it tied in so beautifully because God's Spirit's working. We have this great responsibility so that like God, you know, in Isaiah 55, you might be thinking of, his words don't return to him empty or void. That's what God desires for our words that come out of our mouth. You know, for example, we, we, this has challenged me over the last couple of weeks. You know, are you careful not to be misleading or allowing a misconception to be, uh, for letting somebody believe a misconception you make? That, that, uh, that you allow them to sort of, you're allowed to give it life. Believe something that's not true. You know, it might not even be a lie, but you're just letting something, you don't say something when you should. Um, or you're concealing a matter when you've got a duty to share something to your brother, you know, or ability to speak up on behalf of somebody else, to intercede for them because they don't have a voice for their own. You know, are you using your words as God would have you? Isaiah 59, Isaiah 59 You've got your Bibles. There's no one enters suit justly. Verse 4 of Isaiah 59. No one goes to law honestly. They rely on empty pleas and they speak lies. They conceive mischief and give birth to iniquity. Now they were talk, talking to the culture of the day, but that's so true in our culture you know, you see in politicians, for example, which I'm sure came to your mind so clearly. But there's something for us here as well. We've dropped down to verse 14. Justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away. For truth has stumbled in the public squares and uprightness cannot enter. Now, a public square was, was used for, for all matters 
for, for social reasons, for commercial users like the markets um, where they used to trade and sell and for judicial purposes where they, they met on, on certain matters regarding law. It was the centre of community life. And this is the same today, you know, where, this, where the truth is not held, upheld. It's been lost in the public square. Yet how are we with our dealings, you know, socially, um, commercially, judicially, you know, when, if, when, when we're in that situation? Are we reflecting justice, as it mentions here, righteousness, truth, and uprightness? Verse 15 says, truth is lacking, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. And I, it's, it's, harder, it's harder to get ahead financially when we do the right thing, when we don't lie to get a better rate on our mortgage, when we de don't declare some, some money to the tax man. It's harder for us. You know? Makes himself a prey. It makes us vulnerable in our relationships when we share with others, when we're open, when we're honest, in love, as appropriate to, 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 to show our heart of what we're thinking, what's going on. We're vulnerable for God then to witness and speak through us to others. You know, if we don't abide by this in truth and, and rightness in everything we say, now, brethren, there's a, there's a battle going on for our hearts. And as Jesus called the, the devil the father of lies, you know, the father of lies, he wants us no, nothing else more than to just take us slightly away to follow his ways, to play by his rules so we can be rid of our full potential as image bearers of Christ. Matthew chapter 12. Let's see what Jesus says about our words. In verse 33. I know it's familiar words, but it's there for a reason. Matthew 12, verse 33. Either make the truth good and its fruit good, or make the tree, the tree bad. So make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruits. You know, we, we see that where we, we see the actions of people and we know who they are or what they do. But look at the context here. It says, you brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. He's talking about the fruit of our lips, not that the opposite isn't true. But he's talking about the fruit of our lips. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word that they speak. For by your words you'll be justified, or by your words you'll be condemned. Are, they, are your words returning to you empty? Are they void of value, of of? of encouragement, of kindness, of grace, of truth. Matthew 15. Jesus had more to say in Matthew 15. Verse 10. And he called the people to him and said to him, Hear and understand. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a person. Then the disciples said, came to him and said to him, did you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? Because you know, they read the law about the value of, 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 you know, of certain practices in the temple, of not eating certain things, being allowed to eat others. Drop down to verse 15. But Peter said to him, to Jesus, explain the parable to us. He said to them, are you still with that understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And that defiles a person. What comes out of the heart, it defiles a person. Comes into the mouth, you know. It speaks of a greater truth, of, what, of who you are. 
For out of the heart will come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. These are what defile a person. Can you see a link between what we say and who we are? Now, our word shows us what's going on in our heart. And it can lead to these things. You know, God came to Cain and said, sin is crouching at the door. You must overcome it. He had this, this um, conversation. It was reasoning. And, and Cain reasoned the opposite way because he didn't heed the voice, the word of God. Not only do we have a great responsibility with our words we speak, but we find that they have power, great power, you know, whether for good or for bad. Proverbs 25, 11, 13, I'll just quickly read it. It says, A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. It's beautiful. Great worth. Like a gold ring or an ornament of gold is a wise reprover to a listening ear. Like the cold of a snow in this time of harvest is a faithful messenger to those who send him. He refreshes the souls of his master. Think about it in context of our words. Do they have value? Are they pleasing to our master? Like that snow would be to rejuvenate the soil. Yet we see the opposite's true. As we we read in James, we'll turn there, James chapter 3. James chapter 3. Because like they can have such worth and value and be so beautiful, they also can do the opposite. Verse 1, James chapter 3. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that those who teach will be judged with greater strictness. So we be careful, especially occupying the, the pulpit. Ensure everything is is guided by the word of God. For we stumble in many ways, but if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man. You know, Jesus was a perfect man. He always had the right word to say, even in some of his harder harder judgments. He never spoke out of turn. So if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. Use the example, if we put bits in the mouth of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. And our horse is a, is a absolutely, I don't know if you've stand by a horse lately, but they are an amazing creature. They're huge. Power in their legs. You don't want to be standing behind them if they, if they uh, kick out. And we put this little bit of metal between their, their teeth and that's enough to steer them wherever we go and use them for, for good, for value, for for doing certain things. Look at the ships also, you know, on an even bigger scale if we think of the ships today that traverse our seas. Though they are also so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member. It's a small part of our body, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue, it can be, is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. If we don't bridle it, we don't make sure we use it properly. The tongue is set among many members, staining the whole body. What comes out from it? It can be cringe. And this is amazing here. Setting, the tongue is set among many members, staying the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and how your trajectory can change by just the words that you speak or don't speak. And set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast or, or bird or reptile or sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. You know, we've, we've got lots of pets. We've got them in zoos. But no, bit t- no human being can tame the tongue by themselves, I'll add. It is restless evil, full of deadly poison. 
With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. So we've been given this, this beautiful mouthpiece. We can bless God with it, being made in his image for good things. And then those who are also made in God's image, in his likeness, we go in a bad mouth <laughs> with the same, the same tongue. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing, my brothers. But these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? No. Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives? You know, bitter. Or a, a grapevine produce figs? Does it work? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. There's great damage the tongue can do if it's not used properly. But imagine the, the repair, the healing, you know, the good that it can be done with it as well. Now, Jesus was full of grace and truth and he always spoke just the right words at the right time and we are to emulate him. But we need his help. We need God's help. And there's a beautiful prayer that we should all pray in, in, in Psalm 141. It says, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch at the door of my lips. I can't do it myself. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep a watch at the door of my lips. It's a gateway. And even in, the, in the, the, medical, the medical field, they say this is a gateway to the, the rest of the health of our body. Proverbs 13, 3. He who guards his mouth protects his life, but the one who opens lips, his lips invites his own ruin. Without God in the picture, it doesn't end well. We, we, you know, we, we step, step in it, we put our foot in our mouth and we just mumble our words. And we speak out a turn and we hurt people and we, and we do... We make ruin. Proverbs 12, 21, 23. He who guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from distress. So in conclusion, we think back to God creating everything. And he brought it into existence long ago. But he took, he, he had some intentionality. He didn't think it into existence. Although he could have done that, he was sovereign. He intentionally spoke it. And it was so as he moved through the personified word of God, Jesus, and he brought life. And by that same word, he continually sustains it. Creation through the power of his word. So for us, being made in God's image and likeness, having now received that divine spirit, we have power in our word to bring life and sustenance to our connections and our relationships. Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it, whether death or the life, will eat its fruits. Just like that family that we started with this morning, our family friends. Let's do all we can as Christ works in us, to safe keep our word, make sure we're full of grace, full of truth, only things that build up of value. So the words that go forth from our mouths don't return to us void. <laughs>